Okay, I, I want to invite everybody. Okay, we had, uh, we had the privilege to have a short coffee break before you start. Uh, so really, it's my uh, great honor and uh, privilege to invite uh, Professor Karl's, Karl Heinz Meyer. He is the vice uh, director, if I may say. I don't know exactly the definition. Cool. The core director. I knew. I knew that there was something. Uh, of the Human Brain Project. In his training, he is a physicist uh, from the University of Heidelberg, um, dealing with uh, particle f uh, physicists and moving slowly but surely more to computational neuroscience. And um, he will try to show us both his research and the Human Brain Project. Is it true? Thank you, Thank you for, the, for the introduction. I mean, this lecture really should have been yesterday uh, when there was a sort of the scientific part. But believe it or not, I had to teach, so which is probably good because this is a, a workshop about training. So somebody has to do the training. And I did it yesterday. I arrived last night at 2 o'clock but I'm fresh and active now after this coffee, and I'm going to talk about a scientific topic, work we are going to do in the Human Brain Project, work we did in the past, and I will try to make links to education and training wherever I can. And uh, the topic I'm going to talk about is interdisciplinary in the sense that it mixes uh, neuroscience and computing, but the reason I call this talk a mixed double or mixed doubles, which some of you may know from tennis. By the way, I'm not playing tennis, but uh, I, I, I use that word because there is also a, another kind of uh, interplay between the two areas, which is uh, one topic of discussion in HPP, and that is, are we using computing to do neuroscience or are we using neuroscience to design new computers, which are as you will see, slightly different questions. And the studies we have to do, the devices we have to build, will be somewhat different, depending on which way you go. And this will be maybe one of the scientific questions I want to address in this talk. As I'm a physicist, I'm going to start with a picture which is not the brain. Uh, but it's not the universe, but it's a tiny little part of the universe. It's, it's a galaxy, and I want to use, or two galaxies, I, I want to use this image to, to argue with you that simulation is a useful thing. This is one of the main criticisms towards the Human Brain Project, which I hear in many of my presentations when people tell me, you shouldn't simulate the brain at this point because you haven't understood it. Okay? So you should first work understanding the brain, doing all the necessary neuroscience work, and once you understood it, you should start simulating it. You should do it like the astrophysicists. Like what you see here, one of these galaxies is recorded by a telescope, actually by many telescopes, and the other one, as you see on the label here, is simulated. And many people think that it worked like that, that the astrophysicists discovered the, the, uh, the uh, galaxies. They found all the laws of gravitation, angular momentum conservation, and all these things. They, they put all this in, this in the simulation, and they find, oh my God, it looks like the real thing. So we probably understood it, and that's it. If that would be all, it would be really boring, and it would not be worthwhile to invest all these efforts into supercomputers to just replicate, which basically you understood before. But actually, these people do something else. They do fundamental science using simulations. How can they do that? Well, it's maybe a bit surprising, but if you look to the structure of a galaxy, it's not understood from the physics we know. The physics we know would, would predict galaxies that look totally different. The rotation curves, for example, would look totally different. And uh, although this is a neuroscience conference, I dare to say uh, that there is probably something like dark matter in our universe, and we don't know what it is. But what you can do in the simulation, you can switch it on, you can switch it off, and you can vary the parameters. You can play with the fundamental science. And if you play with the fundamental science, you observe the simulated object and you compare it to nature. And by that, you extract insights about the fundamental physics underlying the structure formation in the universe. And that's very interesting. That means supercomputing is really a tool to do science. It's not just a pretty 
visualization tool, is what many people think. Okay? Now you look at the brain, you know these, these pictures here, which are ancient by now, and together with work by others, we know by now, of course, that the brain is not a piece of uniform dark matter, but that it has this kind of, uh, of gray matter, sorry, I certainly have used dark matter again, uh, of, of uniform piece of matter, but it has this structure. It, con it consists of individual cells which are spatially separated, and they are connected by nerve fibers, and there is what, what a physicist would call an interaction over a distance. And we also know by now that there is integration taking place, integration in space because a neuron receives inputs from many other neurons like 10,000 or so and also integration in time because there is a certain time structure of the postsynaptic potential and so that even spikes which arrive at the, at the postsynaptic neuron at different times can overlap and integrate and produce a high increase or decrease of the membrane potential. So this is a an object which really is described by units that interact with, with each other and in that sense it's a bit similar to the galaxies. And of course, you may say, well, then, if we know the rules how these things interact, and if we know the rules by which they communicate, we should also be able to simulate it. And you have seen this before in the morning, and there was the question, what can you do with these kind of simulations? This is a, a cortical column, about 10,000 neurons, 10,000 times as many synapses. The color code here represents the voltage difference between the inside and the outside, which is color-coded, so you see the firing neurons, you see the responding neurons, and, 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 and you, what you see here is a repeating movie. It, rep it, it replicates about 200 milliseconds of the lifetime of an isolated cortical column. I'm not showing this to discuss the neuroscience of this, which in any case I wouldn't understand. I, I'm discussing this uh, 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 to show you another aspect of simulation, which is that it is more difficult, far more difficult, to simulate the brain than it is to simulate a galaxy. And why is that so? Uh, if you look at this cortical column, 10,000 neurons, for this simulation, people used a supercomputer in those old days, a couple of years ago, which consumed an electrical power of about 100 kilowatt, 100,000 watts. If you do a very simple scaling, which is certainly wrong, as I will show on the next picture, but it's not totally wrong. If you do this scaling uh, to the human brain, uh, which uh, contains about 10 to the 11 neurons and consumes a, a power energy per time of something like 20 to 30 watts, uh, you, you see, and, and you, you know the number of neurons, you just do the multiplications, you see that the simulation for that system would consume about 1,000 gigawatts, which doesn't sound like a number you can easily understand, but just to put it into perspective, 1,000 gigawatts, that's uh, the sum of all electrical power stations that were installed in Germany, I think, back in 2010. It's five times that, basically. In Germany, there were 200 gigawatts, and for that simulation, you need 1,000. So you need five times all electrical power stations of Germany to run this simulation. And now, even worse than that, there is power and there is energy, and you have to carefully distinguish between power and energy. Power is energy per time. And the question is, how long does it take you to run this simulation? These are 200 milliseconds. Simulations like this typically run a factor 1,000 slower than biology. So if you want to simulate a day worth of, say, learning or self-organization of a system like that, it will take you 1,000 days to get the results which is three years, okay? And during those three years, you have to run those power stations all the time with a thousand gigawatts. And this already tells you that it's just, it's just not accessible that way. It cannot be done. There is no way. I mean, of course, computers get better, we know that, uh, but they don't get that much better. And I will give you some rather drastic numbers later. So we really have to invent new ways of, of attacking this kind of simulation. And, and, and one way, of course, is, and this is what the Human Brain Project is going to do, is to exploit what we call the spatial scales of the system. I mean, people that do supercomputer simulations, for example, for weather predictions, what they do is they simulate the weather very nicely in the area where they want to make the prediction, like, for example, in the city of Tel Aviv, if you want to predict the weather in the city of Tel Aviv. But, but, but then, of course, you have, to, you have to also take into account the weather in the surrounding area, maybe the whole Mediterranean or something like that. But you don't do that with the same resolution. So you do something which is called adaptive sampling. You adapt the, the, the precision of your resolution, the spatial precision, 
to the, the special problem that you want to study. Now, the scales in the brain, in a way, are almost given by nature. There are molecules, there are uh, cells, there are uh, cell populations, there are functional units, there is the whole brain. So these scales more or less look at you, and it's obvious that it must be possible to do what we call multi-scale simulation. So we, we might run a simulation where a certain part, a large part, is really based on individual cells which are simulated to some detail, like the simulation I've shown before. Others are simulated by mean field approaches which sort of average over larger areas, and you may even think of having a part of your simulation running, running on almost on the molecular uh, level. So mixing scales is probably the only solution uh, to really do these kind of simulations on supercomputers. There are a few numbers here which are quite interesting. Uh, for example, where is it here? If, if you want to store uh, a cell uh, in the, on, on the, the kind of simulation that Henry Markram is currently running in Lausanne, he typically uses a, a megabyte to describe a neuron. If you have a simplified neuron level with which you can use to simulate larger areas of the brain, you can do that for about 100 kilobytes if you want to go to the molecular level, you would need something like 100 terabytes. Nobody has ever done that for a single neuron. But that is probably the secret to do full brain simulation, or certainly the secret to do this kind of multi-scale uh, approach. And here are some numbers about uh, the usage of exascale computing and also the, the, uh, the uh, memory you need to store a brain. I do not want to talk about supercomputing, though. I want to talk about something else, which is couldn't we also go away from the traditional computing aspect and couldn't we build computers that are really radically fundamentally different in the sense that they do not solve differential equations, in the sense that bytes and bits are not the units we talked about, but really we use the same units that are there in biology, uh, which are Siemens and Farads and Amperes, which means the physical quantities. And this is the idea of neuromorphic computing. And uh, so what I want to discuss a little bit with, here, with you here is how much do we actually pay for a neural computation? Why is there 30 watts in this brain? And, and we know from, from molecular biology uh, that energy is actually taken from hydrolysis of ATP molecules. And, and, and we know pretty well from literature how many ATP molecules you need to produce an action potential <coughs> or a synaptic transmission. We also know that we, we get about one electron volt from the hydrolysis of one ATP molecule. So we can do all the multiplications. We find that we have to pay about a femtojoule for a synaptic transmission, about 10 to the minus 10 joule for an action potential. And we, if we do some kind of multiplication with firing rates, we end up uh, with, with, with reasonable numbers like 10 to 20 or 50 watts. Okay? So that means from the biology, biological point of view, we more or less understood why the brain is so energy efficient. So why is the computer so terribly inefficient? Then? And many people say, well, that's because of the devices. Okay? The transistors are bad devices. They consume so much energy that they are not, not, not really suited to do neural computation. And, and one of my big messages in this talk is that this is not true. Transistors are as efficient as synapses, for example. Why is that? What is a transistor? A transistor is, is just like a, it's a capacitor, okay? It influences the charge flowing underneath. And what you do is, if you switch a transistor in a normal microprocessor, like the one I'm using now, is you charge, you put charge on this capacitor. And, and every physicist, that is even part of the biology education, I think. <coughs> the, the energy stored in the capacitor is the capacitance voltage squared divided by two. And uh, so you can put in some reasonable numbers, and, and what you come up with is to charge a transistor. To make it switch, you need about one femtojoule, uh, which is really very, very little. Remember that, that a synaptic transi the transition costs you 10 femtojoules. So that's like 10 transistors. So if you could make a synapse model based, of, based of, on, on 10 transistors, it could be as efficient as the brain. And these are even very old-fashioned transistors. The modern ones are much better. Then why are these computers so bad? We haven't understood that. Huh? We, know, we know why the brain is so efficient. We know that the components of our computers are as efficient as the biological components. There is no component, no device problem, but there is another problem. And I guess you know that. It's the architecture problem. It's the architecture and communication problem. Of course, we do not just charge little transistors and let them behave like synapses. What we do is 
we have this whole network of transistors. This is just the copper structure in a normal, uh, rather old-fashioned microprocessor. And of course, you have to charge all these connecting lines. And then there is a much worse problem. The communication, of course, is based on binary coded Boolean algebra. Okay? So what you have to do, if you want to calculate an exponential function, you have to do use the lookup table or you have to use a Taylor expansion and you have to do a lot of multiplications and, and, and summations and in order to do that you use this wonderful architecture which is the basis for all our modern computing it's the so-called von Neumann architecture we'll come back to John von Neumann later okay and the von Neumann architecture says there is a processor and then there are memories for data and program they may also be in the same unit but you always have to shift the data back and forth just to do adding two numbers, multiplying two numbers, or calculating an exponential. And this is really why we burn all these energies in modern computers. So the, the idea is rather obvious, and it's an old idea. It goes back to Carl Vermeer, a student of Richard Feynman, actually back in the 80s, uh, uh, who had this idea of neuromorphic computing. And, and it's very simple to say, rather than putting a brain in a computer, which we do on the supercomputers, we may want to build computers that are more like brains. And uh, so that's the idea of neuromorphic computing. The basic idea is uh, you put little entities on a silicon substrate which are behaving like the neural cells. So that means you do not solve differential equations, but you just build little circuits that behave like cells. So a neural cell is a unit or an entity on the silicon substrate. There is an interesting aspect to it whatever you do in this system, which then have the same parallelism as the brain, it means that they will not have global synchronization and time, which sounds a bit trivial, but as you will see later, this is important. Time is a continuous variable, like in real life. Okay? Uh, on a normal computer, time is not a continuous variable. Time is defined by an external clock. And the interesting thing is you can stop the clock. You can let it run backwards. You can run it fast and slow. And by that, you can, you can choose the time independent of, of, of the real time running outside. This you cannot do on a neuromorphic system. Time is given by the physical properties of the components. That's a bit hard to understand, but I will explain that a bit more. So what do I mean by neuromorphic computing? It's a physical model rather than a mathematical model. This is a super stupid, simple cell of a patch of a neuron, okay, of, of a muon membrane. It, it has an isolating layer, which is the, the, the membrane, which corresponds to electrically to a capacitance, and you have some ion channels, which under voltage control are able to conduct ions through the membrane, and then you have some kind of, of reversal potential or standard potential, which is given by some biochemical processes. So this kind of little circuit, which is a sort of, a, for the physicist, this is a Kirchhoff type circuit, this is very easy to build. You just go to, how you say, a radio shack, and you buy yourself a battery and a resistor and a capacitor. You wire this up, and you have this kind of circuit. And if you switch it on, you know that the capacitor will charge according to an exponential function. And you can easily calculate that. This thing is perfectly described by this differential equation, which describes the voltage dependent as a function of time. And, and of course, the solution of that is a, is a differential equation. So if you have 10 to the 11 of those differential equations and they are all coupled through the synaptic connections, this starts to be very difficult. And you need these big computers. So the idea of neuromorphic computing is you don't talk about equations, you don't talk about memory, about programs, about binary coding, forget all this. Just buy yourself a lot of batteries and capacitances and contactances <coughs> and wire them up to build a big network. That's the basic idea. Now, how does it work? Uh, a little, this is the only really complicated slide. It will, will, will get a lot easier later. But I mean, we're coming back to this differential equation here. And, and, and you know that if there's, it's a capacitor and a, and a resistor, if you multiply those two numbers, there is something like a time constant. That's the typical decay time constant of the membrane potential or the time constant, it, it, it charges up to the battery voltage. Now, that kind of time constant is called the membrane time constant, and as I said, it depends on the value of the capacitor and, and, and the conductance. Now, if capacitances and conductances, as you see in these little tables, are very small in biology, it means that these systems are very fast. The intrinsic time constants are very fast. That means the physical time, and I talked about that before, is scaled by a certain factor compared to biology. So if you choose small units, your system will run faster. 
and it's continuous time. You cannot stop it. You cannot say, please run a bit slower now, or please stop. The same brain, it's the same way you cannot tell your brain to stop. You cannot tell the systems to stop, because they are just evolving according to physical laws. And the time constant, this is my case, if you want them to be so, you can make them much faster, like a factor 1,000, 10,000, or 100,000 faster than biology, which is an interesting aspect. Now, of course, you make more complex models. This is the model we developed in one of the previous projects, the facets project, which I mentioned this morning. You recognize the first part of the differential equation, but it has all kinds of fancy features like describing bursting, uh, irregular firing, regular firing, adaptation, and these kinds of things. I have no time to go into details. The next thing is you sit down and you draw a circuit diagram, which is not just a battery, a resistor, and a capacitor, but it actually consists of about 300 transistors uh, on an area of 150 by 20 micrometers made with transistors that are typically a size of 180 nanometers. So this is what a neuron looks like. Actually, these are two neurons. And then, because this is just a model of a brain circuit, you exploit the fact that you use the same massive parallelism. That means if you have one neuron, it's very easy, in quotation mark, to make large systems. Huh? You just use one, and you copy the thing. You have two neurons. These are mirror neurons, actually. And you copy again, and you have four. And you copy again, you have six, eight, ten, twelve. And you go on, and you have a chip like that. Okay, so it looks like this. This is a, a, a one centimeter by five millimeter chip. So where are the neurons here? Can you recognize them? Probably not. Uh, they, they look different here. They're actually this funny green strip here. So that means you have this huge chip. It's one centimeter by five, 0.5 centimeters. And the neurons are almost... They are totally irrelevant. I mean, there are very fancy circuits. I mean, all our knowledge about neuroscience that we were able to put in, like these different firing modes, they are all in. But at the end on the chip, they are totally irrelevant in terms of real estate. What is all the rest? What is this blue area here? Well, you probably guessed that it's all connections. It's the synopsis. The synapses that occupy most of the space, and then this area around here is the connection. So like in the, in the real brain, the connections are the real challenge for this kind of neuromorphic computing. Still, you can build these things, and chip looks like that. You recognize now this kind of structure. Now you want to build bigger systems, and uh, one of the ideas is to have these little wires here. You see little wires which are emerging from the silicon patch there. And by that, you can build a larger system. Now, stringing all these little wires is a lot of work, and we didn't want to do this. So what we did is we left the silicon wafer intact. Chips are not produced in little pieces, but they are produced on 20 centimeter large units. So we didn't cut this into pieces, but we left all the chips uh, on the wafer. We assembled this into a system. So you have the wafer down here, and you have all these electronics, which does the communication, the readout the communication with external data, sending data in, reading data out. And on this system, which we call a neural processing unit, we have 200,000 neurons, 50 million plastic synopsis. That means they are able to do learning. I will show you some examples. And uh, interestingly enough, this system is running 10,000 times faster than biology. This is a computer drawing. It looks like a spaceship. It looks like this is something you do maybe in the next 10 years. But it's actually not. The system exists. We have it in our lab. This is what it looks like if physicists build these things. There are lots of cables which are all there to control the system, but behind this metal plate here, we have this couple of hundred thousand neurons. So what can you do with it? You can do experiments. I mean, that's why you do all this. And we have defined four categories of experiments to do this. The first one is to just switch it on, you see what it does, without communicating with external data. Just really see whether the system behaves like, like uh, what you observe in biology or what you what you expect from your theoretical models. You look for self-firing patterns, synchronization effects, stability, order chaos, and things like that. The second category of experiments is what most people expect us to do. And I will show you two examples. It's what I call biologically realistic reverse engineered circuits in closed loop experiments. This is also what we want to do in HPP. Okay? That is very, very important. We want to reverse engineer circuits with the parameters, and we want to expose those circuits to data which are outside, like I am myself acting in a closed loop environment in a perception action loop, we want to do the same thing with these synthetic systems. So we want to look to small brains, like insect brains, cortical structures, like cortical columns, cortical columns are mentioned there, 
functional units, maybe even bigger systems. Also, this, by the way, could be done in a multi-scale fashion by building hybrid systems. Then, very cool, very interesting, and this has started now also very intensely in HPP, is to implement and test what I call fundamental gen generic concept and theories, which are not necessarily reverse engineered circuits from biology. What do I mean by that? There is a concept called liquid <coughs> computing. Some of you may have heard about it. It's coming from the group of Wolfgang Mass in, in Graz, uh, which is a very exciting concept where you, have, where you see the network as an excitable uh, liquid or multidimensional system. You send information in, it stays there for a while until it dissipates. So you can do interesting type of computing. By the way, this is a concept that has been developed by Henry Markram and, uh, and uh, Wolfgang Mass together. Probabilistic inference in Boltzmann machines with spiking neurons are other aspects of our work. Then point four, at the end, probably the most exciting thing is to use these computers. And this really means we use neuroscience for computers outside neuroscience. That means, that means we want to build neuromorphic controllers for machines, engines, manufacturing plants, do spatial pen temporal pattern recognition in data streams, for example, finding causal relations in big data, and doing approximate computing. So from now on, I will, I will switch to the teaching aspect. What do I mean by that? We are building this big system, and it's currently brought into operation. We are doing experiments. But most of the publications that we produced were actually done with, I would call it a toy system. It's a single chip. You see a single chip here. And, and what we did, we put it on, onto one of these little things. This is like, the, some of you may know these Raspberry Pi boards, which you can buy for 30 euros. Okay? And you can, you can connect it to a screen, and then you have a computer for almost nothing, and you can do all, kind, all kinds of funny things with it. And we tried to do the same thing. So we, we built this little printed circuit board. This is our chip here, which sits under a blob of black plastic. And this is the only thing you have to connect initially. It's a USB cable. Okay? So you plug in the USB cable, you plug it into your laptop, and you have your own neuromorphic computer. It's a small one. Okay? It has just you see there, about 400 neurons and 100,000 uh, 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 synapses. But you can do interesting experiments. And the idea is the following, because we are really lacking vision and inspiration, because we are just building these things. I mean, we have some ideas. But our idea is that if we, if we distribute that really to several thousand people, like the Raspberry Pi, and you can buy this thing for, we still don't know really the price, like a couple of hundred dollars or euros, then it could probably spread. And there are many people out there, students, school children, schools, universities, that can play with these things and come up with interesting applications. So this is because you understand that this is a, really a very different way of doing computing. This is not writing code. You cannot write code. You have, to, you have to write code to configure the system. But then it just runs like a little brain, and you have to observe it. So you have to learn how to use these systems. And we need more people doing it. Okay, so I will show you some examples on... On, on, on what we did. As I said, the very first thing, by the way, this is the other chip, uh, the technicality, but the first thing is you look to single neurons. This is what theory predicts. I mean, these neurons have been designed in order to really replicate firing patterns of, uh, of biological neurons. This is a 2D face space for the, for the expert. Those are typical firing patterns. You see regular firing. You see single firing. You see adaptation up there. So you see chaotic firing. You see bursting. So can you see this also on your, on your silicon system? Yes, indeed, you can do that. And, and all the, real, the results I show, no exception, all the results I show from now on have been done by students, actually, actually by bachelor and master students in our group. So this is really something that can be given now to students. And this is a case where it requires some knowledge of electrical engineering, some knowledge of physics, and a lot, some knowledge of neuroscience. And here we really need people that are coming from one field and are willing to learn the other area. So you see the same kind of firing pattern on the silicon. That's maybe not so surprising. Interesting now is, is that you go to small brains or subsets of small brains. This is an insect, as you can uh, easily recognize. And insects have, of course, many sensors. And, and one of the sensors are the glomeruli system, which is used to do olfaction. So you know that uh, insects are uh, able to distinguish different types of flowers, and, um, and flowers trigger certain sensors uh, in the, in, in the, on, on this antennal lobe of the, of the insects, and then the combination of those sensor data 
is being associated with a certain flower. So what you have to do is sort of a decorrelation of the input data and an association to certain flower types. So it's a decorrelation association type architecture. And the architecture has been very nicely described by Michael Schmucker, who's actually a neuroscientist. Okay. This is the student. But he is the neuroscientist in the game. He brought in his knowledge about the insect olfactory system. This is the circuit he proposed. And this became a Pinos paper, actually, which is quite amazing for a student. Uh, so um, we have these receptor neurons. We do the decorrelation. Uh, and we have the association layer, which is basically a winner take all type network. I have no time to describe that in detail. But the important thing is that there are projecting links from the projection neurons, this is why they are called projecting neurons, to the association neurons. And of course, the, the, the system has to learn what it has to do. You have to go through a teaching to a learning process, a self of an off, a, 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 a learning process. And that you do by, by tuning these connections here. So you build up this network according to the biological data and you tune the connections. And you run it on this little chip and what you get is this. So you get, for example, this input on the receptor neurons and somewhere in this mess of spikes, these are the spikes. By the way, these are biological timescales. You have to divide that by a factor of 10,000 to get the electronic timescale. This mess of spikes contains information. It's quite, quite interesting. So the information about the input data is hidden in this which looks like a total mess. Uh, so these are the projection neurons, uh, these are the lateral neurons, uh, the, the, the connecting links, and up there are the association neurons. And there is always a blue and a yellow band, one uh, corresponds to the excitatory, the other one to the inhibitory population. This is before training, this is after training for one certain input, and what you see after training, the system is actually able to recognize and associate uh, a certain data. Now, why would you do that? You can say, well, other people do that as well. This is a standard problem. We're taking standard problems that people use in, in conventional neural networks and machine learning approaches, like Bayesian inference, for example. So how do we compare with a Bayesian classifier? Well, I can say we are doing as good. So then many people say, why are you doing it then? If I can do it on my laptop, why do you spend a couple of million euros and 10 years of European projects to do the same thing on this little chip? There is no point. Well, the argument, of course, is that this is a different type of computing. And the, uh, the promises that neuromorphic computing makes are the following, that at some point they might solve all the problems that conventional computing has. It has an energy problem, I hope I convinced you. It has a reliability problem. Transistors all have to work on normal microprocessors. It has a software problem. I don't have to, to convince you of that. It has a time problem. I said that it has a size problem. The supercomputers are enormous. So neuromorphic computing should be energy efficient, fault-tolerant, self-organized, fast, and compact. So if we could show that, it would really be a big step. And I think we are slowly, slowly getting there. Let me tell you the energy scales, okay? I said a synaptic transmission in biology, this is from the Human Brain Project initial report. Uh, a, a synaptic transmission, you pay 10 cents to joule, all right? In biology, your own brain. In the very detailed simulation, of Henry's group in Lausanne, they pay a joule. That is 14 orders of magnitude. That's a one with 14 zeros. That's not a small factor. I mean, it's, it's not something we easily get by just waiting for the next version of a, of a new computer. So what, what are the neuromorphic systems doing? So the system we're having now, which is running now, it uses about 10 to the minus 10, which is about a factor of 10,000 away from biology. It's a big factor to the to the uh, Lausanne system, but that's an unfair comparison because Henry's neurons are very detailed. They are really reconstructed from biological data. We should compare ourselves to the point neurons, which are, for example, running on, on, the, on the supercomputing center, the Diesmann group in, uh, in, uh, in Zurich, and, and they are using about 10 to the minus 4. So you see it's a big step. This is a log scale, of course. This, by the way, is the Spinnaker system, which is a different approach to neuromorphic computing, which I will also describe very Shortly. So there is this huge energy increase, uh, energy efficiency increase. Maybe more important, there is the time scales aspect. I said, if, if, I mean, in nature, there are different time scales. There is detection of causality, STTP, for example, which is happening on the 100 microsecond scale. Plasticity, maybe on the, long, uh, on the second scale, learning days, development years. If you dare to talk about evolution, it takes thousands of years. And, uh, if you run this on a conventional computer, and I said with, with great detail, it runs a factor of 1,000 slower 
That means if you want to do studies of development, it will take you a thousand years to run this simulation, and, and that definitely is out of reach. You can try to make faster simulations. Maybe you gain a factor of thousand or so. It would still be very, very slow. Now, with these accelerated systems, ours apparently runs a factor of 10,000 faster. You can compress, for example, the day to 10 seconds. And why would you do that? Not to do the experiment once, of course. I mean, then you might as well use, uh, wait a full day. Well, what's the point whether you use one day or 10 seconds maybe is not so important. But of course, you have to repeat this experiment many times. You have to scan parameter spaces. You have to optimize your circuit. You have to ev uh, evaluate many different possibilities. And this is why we think that this temporal dynamics is the key to understanding computational paradigms of the brain, and it has to be studied by a system that runs in an accelerated mode. Reliability is a very important thing. Uh, I said uh, transistors in conventional microprocessors, they all have to be the same. There's this famous joke of Carver Mead, uh, which he uh, put at the, at the beginning of his book about analog VLSI and neural computing. It says, unlike American citizens, not all transistors are the same. Okay, if they are being produced, <laughs> they come with a large spread. And, uh, and this large spread has to be compensated by clever circuits. It's not so easy if you want to do digital computing. How does it look in our case? This is the response curves of neurons. These are the receptor neurons. This is the measured data. And this is the firing rate uh, of the projector neurons, which, which are fed by the receptor neurons. So this should be a linear relation. It's just a characteristic curve. And you see, it is a linear relation. If the input rate goes up, the output rate goes up. So that's great. Okay? But what you see is there are very different neurons. Some of them hardly react at all, and others react by a factor 10 more. So there's a huge spread. These neurons are electronically a disaster. Why is that? I mean, they are analog circuits, and all these transistors show variations. The circuits on paper are all precisely the same, but the electronic organization shows a big spread. So it's typically 10, 20, 30 percent, depending on whether you look at sigma or full width half maximum or whatever. So there's a huge spread. The thing is that what you could do is to calibrate all that. You can move all, yeah, I'm almost through. You can move all these things together, uh, uh, but we didn't do that. We just used the systems in this uncalibrated fashion, and we showed that the system automatically learns to use population coding where uh, the uh, Variability is just compensated by big numbers, which is a very important result. I have another animal for you, which is not the bat, which we will see tomorrow, but the barn owl. The barn owl can locate mice. It doesn't produce sound itself, but it can locate mice. It does it by uh, 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 compensating delay lines, and it uses a learning mechanism, stdp type mechanism, which has been proposed by Wolfram Gerstner, and it was another PhD student, ann katrin Scherzer, in our group. She implemented that with our analog synopsis and showed that she can achieve a timing resolution of about 10 nanoseconds, which is much better than the barn owl. Why is that? Because there is this acceleration factor. So why I'm talking about tennis here? I think neuromorphic systems are interesting computing approaches, but you can use them for two, two different ways of doing computing. One is you can use them, it's hard to read here, I'm sorry, neuromorphic systems can be used as reliable, fast, efficient, and compact computational neuroscience simulators. That means you could use these systems to, to, to study neuroscience, to better understand learning, plasticity, dynamics of systems, and things like that, just to make computers that are better suited to do computational neuroscience. That's where computing helps computational neuroscience. But there is the other approach. Neuromorphic systems provide the highest possible degree of biologically relevant complexity under user control. That means I, I, I exploit the fact that there is this noise in the system, temporal and spatial noise, and I use that to do a different kind of computing. And this is where neuroscience helps new computing architectures. And uh, both things we felt should be present in HPP very shortly. This is why we have two different approaches. We build two different complementary systems. One is a many-core digital system built by the Manchester group of Steve Ferber. The other one is the physical model system where I spend all my time with today. We are a bit in the situation, I think, of these two gentlemen here, John van Neumann and Robert Oppenheimer, who in 1952 built this funny computer, which was the one of the first, the second, the first was in Manchester, but this was one of the first digital machines that was programmable, and I like this approach very much because they took a conscious decision which was very important. They said, 
let's not care about devices. The transistor was already discovered then. It was in principle there, okay? But what they, what they decided is to use state-of-the-art devices, which was electron tubes, mercury delay lines, all kinds of strange things which you don't even know what they are, okay? And they fully concentrated on the architecture, and the architecture survived. This is what we still have. And this is why also we and HPP decided not to work on fancy new devices, but to concentrate on the architecture. And we are building these two systems, this one here in Manchester, which is a million arm cores, this one here in Heidelberg, which is four million neurons and a billion conductance-based synapses. Both systems are supposed to be ready next year, actually, which is quite amazing. But of course, we build on the previous work. Uh, I have to show you this. This is terrible. Neuromorphic computing has been called the first big tech buzzword of 2014, uh, which is not good. Uh, but we think it's more than a buzzword. We think we are probably pretty close of doing some non-trivial things. I admit that what we did so far is still rather trivial. Uh, but if the systems are large enough, we will be able to do things that you cannot do anymore on conventional computers. So I think it's a nice project, and it's a sub-project in HPP. It's one of 12 subprojects in HPP. It's called Subproject 9, Neuromorphic Computing. And there's one thing I want to point out, it can only survive because there are the other subprojects. This subprojects, I skipped this slide, it will learn from the simulations, from the high performance computer simulations, which have the full complexity. So we can, in a controlled way, reduce the complexity and put it into our neuromorphic systems. It will build on the closed loop experiments where people build neurorobotics. Uh, systems. It will be based on the data, of course, that we get in the neuroinformatics databases. So I really believe that this is a very, very coherent project and it's an exciting project, but it has, and I think it was discussed yesterday, it certainly has a certain emphasis on computing technologies, but it's making, I think, very interesting use of computing technologies. And as I try to convince you, both sides, I think, will profit, the neuroscience side and the computing side. Thank you very much. Go ahead. This is a beautiful project, and I'd like to commend you on, uh, on Spikey, which I think is beautiful that you took the time to create a device and give it to the masses and see what they'll do. It, it will come soon. We, we, we are now starting the, uh, what is it called, this, uh, this crowdfunding. And, uh, so, I want one, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> one billion tools. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to ask, I couldn't understand, maybe I missed it. Is, is this system something that I just started and I get an output at the end, or can I monitor along the timeline what, what the yeah. state of the system that's, is? That's, that's very, very important. In fact, we spend a lot of effort to be able to monitor what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not just an input-output system. Then you might as well just use a mouse. Uh, exactly. where, where it, does this, it does much better things, but you cannot look inside. So here you can look inside. So you can look at every single spike. And you can even look uh, at, at sub-threshold membrane potentials. You can read out individual membrane potentials. And you can monitor the change of synapses, for example, if you use long-term or short-term plasticity. You, you can plot all this. Now, so having said that, that sounds great. On the other hand, if you do the math, even with just a couple of thousand neurons, this produces a hell of a lot of data. And the question is, do you really want to store all this information, or shouldn't you go and calculate some aggregated quantities, like correlations, for example, like the equivalent of local field potentials. So this is what we are, what we are <coughs> discussing now a lot. I mean, it's a, lot like, a bit like if you want to describe the gas in this room, for example, the, the molecules. Do you really want to track every single molecule and see where it goes? It's probably not interesting. You need some, some sort of collective quantities, thermodynamic-like quantities, like, like entropy or temperature or pressure. And so we are working a lot with... Uh, with the uh, theoretical physicists now to come up with collective quantities. But if people have ideas, this all can be done. I mean, you, you have the resources. On this little board, I didn't say it. There was our chip, but there is also a, a conventional off-the-shelf FPGA, which is a very powerful computing device. And all the spikes go through this FPGA. So you could do any kind of, uh, of, of calculations with those spikes. I've got a second, but this was a fascinating and uh, inspiring talk, so really thank you. Um, what I caught from, one of the things I caught from what you said was that I could expect at some point into the 
not too far future to be able to buy a Raspberry Pi style device that can run a Bayesian classifier faster than a normal computer. Am I correct? Y yes, I mean, I mean, you can see it in our lab today. We have about, what, 20, which we give to the students, but we are not ready to. Uh, to give them to the real, because if you sell something to the public, you have to make more or less sure that it works. Huh? And, and, and this, 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 kind of, this, this, this kind of support is something which worries us a little bit. We have to put it into our housing, we have to, to provide professional documentation and stuff like that. And that will probably take us a couple of months, but it will be very soon. Yes. So, assuming we're talking two years from now, does that mean that in two years we could? reasonably expect to buy a small Bayesian classifier which would be faster than any normal computer? Yeah, yeah, you can buy that thing, yes, yes, yes. That sounds very yeah. economic. I'm not even sure you need to go yeah. outsourcing for that. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, I would still say it's it's kind of a, it's, it's a toy, you yeah? uh, I, I, I have a hard time to see professional applications at this moment. But but what, what we are hoping for is that if there are clever people that come up with interesting circuit, in particular also interfacing it to, to, to sensors and actuators, for example, that there are applications coming up that we didn't think of. And people will also find out what the deficiencies of, this, of the system are. We are in, currently in the process of, gen, uh, of, of designing the next generation of chips for HPP. And, and, and we really need input from, not only from neuroscientists. We neuroscientists give great input. <coughs> But all they tell you is, please be prepared for everything. They want a huge parameter space. <laughs> and that is very hard. I, I really would like to have more specific inputs. And I hope that this is more coming from those people using the system. That's, that's the hope. So, I mean, for example, the next, what the next version will have is what we call a plasticity processor, where we have on this chip many, many little risk processors where you have, can have rules for development, for example. You can rewire the network during operation, like what's happening in the development phase. So I'm, I'm really very excited about that, but that will take a while until this is public. But if you read the, the, the HPP uh, framework partnership agreement, which you cannot because it has just been submitted to the European Commission, but in a couple of months I hope it will be approved and then it's public, you can read our roadmap and it contains a lot of these ideas. Thank you.